Hi, everyone. This is Brittany Bond, and welcome back to the podcast. In today's episode, I am going to share with you how I was able to travel the world for the last almost 10 years to over 70 countries and what journey I went on in order to have the mindset to get to there and also all the things that I did and the goal of me sharing this with you is to empower you and to activate you one to think differently to think more expansive and to also give you some like practical information on how I was able to do this with the goal that you are able to also empower yourself in your life and live the most Um, highest timeline for yourself that your soul lined out for you because all of you all of us have this super expansive what would we be doing with our lives if we were not afraid of anything what would we be doing if we really believed in ourselves we felt this direct connection to source god the universe whatever you want to call it and we were in the epitome of unconditional love where we felt safe to go out and play this game of life, as I like to call it. (sighs) So with that in mind, let's dive right into this episode. Um, I had a lot of you ask me about this in many different ways over the last couple years while I've made this podcast. I made one in the beginning when I first started making podcasts with my girlfriend, Michaela, Um, but that was many moons ago, and I have evolved, you have evolved, and so I thought we could do this together one more time. Um, from a higher perspective. I really believe that everything is life is just this infinity loop of us coming back to the same moment, hopefully uh, a little bit more healed at a higher vibration, looking at it with more tools. So that's what we're going to do here. And okay, so how was I able to travel to all these countries, do all the things? Um, For me, it first started when, um, like I grew up in Northern California um, and already my dad's an entrepreneur so that already helped because I grew up with us in the beginning not having very much money Um, my dad also had cancer when I was seven and he worked as a construction worker in California and if you don't know if you're not in the states and you don't understand it there like there is no universal health care in the states and my dad didn't have uh, he was a contractor so he didn't have health care given to him by his employer and so we were very poor (laughs) we lived off what is called food stamps where the government gives you stamps to like these coupons to go buy food and I don't really even remember how we paid for my dad's medical bills I just remember my parents like fighting a lot about money and being very stressed out about it and then my dad got better and he opened his own construction company in California when the market was really good for this. And suddenly, within three years of us having very low income, we were living within a gated community in one of the richest communities right outside of Sacramento, where all of the doctors and lawyers' families lived who commuted to San Francisco every day. Um, so I was able to see within my mental construct how, and also from an emotional perspective, what is it like to have no money? What is it like to have a lot of money? And also how quickly things can change. That at every moment there is abundance around us. And it's a lot of times about our belief system and our mindset and how we believe that we are worthy and deserving and capable of receiving all of this because when you're in this expansive mindset of i deserve to have whatever is divinely uh, planned for me in this lifetime i deserve to have all of the abundance that's destined for me and i am capable of creating this i'm capable of receiving this then your brain starts working very differently you start looking at everything as an opportunity And I mean this in the most positive way possible. I mean, like, you follow your excitement. Like, people ask me, what do you you do for work? You seem very abundant. Like, how do you make money? I'm like, I just jokingly say, but it's also very true, is whatever I am interested in, whatever I find captivating for me in that moment, whatever is my highest excitement in that moment, I just go super deep into it. I get really nerdy about it. And in some way, from that energy money comes, whether it's me creating something about the thing that I was interested in, or people want to pay me for this knowledge that I suddenly have accrued and, you know, I'm able to share with them, blah, 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 right? So um, ever since I was young, I always wanted to travel. 
Um, like even in my high school, they have these things where like when you're graduating high school, they're like, what are you going to do? Like, where do we see this person in 10 years? And everyone said about me, I didn't realize like how obvious this was or how much I talked about it. But like everyone's like, we see Brittany living outside the country. We see her living in Italy or Spain or blah, blah, blah. And so like even for for my friends, they were like, yeah, Brittany's going places, you know, um, this is just the energy that I carried with myself. Uh, and the traditional route of going to college, university, um, I, I don't think the same as most people. So I was like, I don't like for one within my religion. So within the programming that I was raised in, uh, we were very much discouraged to go to higher education. There's a lot of reasons for this. One of the ones that I'll point out here is because they don't want you to associate with people who are not within the religion. They don't want you to think outside the box. So then you might leave the religion. Another one is because of the power that comes with financial um, freedom. Like, you know, a lot of times in, within the religion I was raised, everyone is working for each other. So you're very interdependent. And this is uh, a way where they also keep you in because if you want to leave, not only is your, uh, your emotional um, livelihood, like everyone you care about is in the religion because you're encouraged to not hang out with people outside of it, but also your livelihood, your financial safety is tied into being part of this community. So... I was raised that higher education was <laughs> not a good thing. It was unnecessary and, you know, just like a negative thing. So I, um, I actually skipped a grade in school when I was young, like in early, like in my elementary school. So I was already younger than everyone else. And when I was in high school, I took what's called in the States AP classes, which means like you can take a full year of math and it counts in high school, and it counts for half of a year in university or college. When you, you know, when you're, so the, the, you basically can like take university classes in high school. So for my last two years of high school, I took all university classes that counted for this. So with me having um, a very high IQ, like all of my guidance counselors at high school were like, "Why are you not applying for university for college? Like you can definitely." get full scholarship, you know, and I was like, I'm not going to do that. I want to travel the world. And I didn't say that to many people because even within my religion, you weren't really encouraged to travel unless it was like for the religion, like as a missionary. So I had this very secret dream inside of myself that I was going to travel. I didn't know quite how that was going to work, but I was going to figure it out, you know? And, um, so fast forward a little bit, I got married at 18 and um, I was working in Starbucks and um, this guy would always come into my work. He worked for an exotic or he, he owned his own exotic car dealership. And I really love cars. This is something random about me, but I really love nice things. I love luxury. This is something to know about me. I'm a very I can live very simply and also I really, really enjoy nice things. So me as an 18 year old, I was like, can I drive your cars? Like, so on my break, he would bring these, of course, you know, he probably thought I was hot or whatever, but uh, he was excited that I was excited about the cars, right? So again, this is what I'm saying about whatever is your excitement uh, leads to beautiful things. So um, he would let me r drive all the cars on my break and I, he would talk to me about them like Porsches and Dodge Vipers and like Land Rovers. I just really loved all of them. And he was like, you know what? Do you want to come work for me? And I'm like, yeah, yes, I do. I want to come work for you. So I worked with him and I like transported a lot of the cars. He would let me take them home for the weekend. Like me as an 18 year old having like a $200,000 uh, car for the weekend. I'm just thinking like, what was he thinking <laughs> to like put this in my hands? And it's like Porsche 911s and stuff. It was really fun. Um, and then it got to the point where I, it became very apparent that... Um, he wanted more from me than I wanted to give from a, like he wanted to be romantic with me, even though I was married. And I was like, okay, this is not going to work. So um, I think he officially laid me off. So this leads to the next part of the story. So that situation ended and nothing dramatic happened. It was just like, this is not going to work anymore. And so in the States, there's something called Department of Workforce Services. And it's basically like the unemployment office. So you can go there and like file for unemployment. So I go there. I'm like filing for unemployment and the guy at the front desk, I'm being my normal bubbly self, you know, like 18, like, da -da -da. hey, can I have unemployment? Da -da -da. 
And this guy, uh, you know, we hit it off. We have a nice conversation. And then he looks at my, my, uh, my file and he's like, uh, have you ever thought about going to university? And I was like, do I look like I can afford to go to university? I'm here filing, filing for unemployment because in the States, like it's not free to go to university. It costs money, right? So, uh, and at the time I did not have that much money. And he said, well, because of your grades and because you took all these university classes already, you actually might qualify for a grant from the Department of Unemployment. So let me have you talk to one of our counselors, our guidance counselors. And I was like, okay, yeah, I'm down to, you know, I'm, I'm excited about this. Let's check this out. So I went and talked to one of the guidance counselors and she looked at my stuff and she was like, you have enough credits within your so basically I had an, I had taken enough credits in high school where I could take a couple more tests and I tested out of my associate's degree which is my undergraduate degree and so all I needed to get was my bachelor's degree and so she was like because you've already done this and your grades are really good um, we can you like you're basically approved to go through this program where we can place you in a job right away you can go to university at night and we'll even like pay for your gas, pay for your books, pay for your clothes to like work in the job. Like, where do you want to work? What industry? And for various reasons, I uh, wanted to work in law. Like I really want, I was very interested in it. I wanted to make a positive impact in the world. I also saw through my parents' divorce how much like having a legal, especially in the States, having a legal defense that you can afford and that actually is on your side is like super important. Um, and so it was like my way of like showing up in the world. And so I was like, I wanna do criminal defense. I wanna like help people who, you know, can't afford, like especially women. I wanted to help women within the legal system. And so they found me um, a law firm that was criminal defense. They helped me buy clothes. They, you know, and I got set up in school. And so I finished my bachelor's degree while I was working in an office. So from the moment I was 18, I was already working in a law firm as a paralegal, um, which is like a step below a lawyer, right? And <laughs> working as a criminal defense uh, paralegal was super interesting because I had to, it basically depended on my, the lawyer I was working for, what cases he chose. And the guy that they placed me with, um, <laughs> in like a TV movie version, he was like the slimy lawyer that like defended the bad guys kind of thing. I didn't know this at the time, but we kept getting cases that he would accept that were like, you know, this guy is accused of molesting his 12 year old daughter. And I'm like, why are we defending him? And he was like, well, everyone deserves a defense. And he also paid me good money. And so I would have to like look through the video interviews of the girl while she's talking about like how her dad molested her and like try and find holes in her story so we could have defense for the dad. And I was like, it was very hard for me, as we say, to take, not take it home. Like emotionally, I would go home and I would just like be so upset about the fact that this was happening in the world. You know, this is something that had happened to me. So it was also super triggering. And also the fact that we were defending the person who was accused of this. And by looking at this girl's video, I could tell that she really, this is just one example of many of this firm that I was at. Um, I could tell that she was telling the truth. So for me, within my ethical framework, it was just not an alignment. So Anyways, I went back to them and I was like, can I switch to a different type of law? And they were like, cool, yeah, what do you want to do? And I was like, well, I'm super into um, inventions. I love anything that's new and like activating within the world. I think I would like to go into intellectual property law. And they were like, okay, cool. So we'll find you uh, a firm. So they found me a firm that I could, a law firm that I could work for. And I ended up working for this law firm until I finished school. And um it was really interesting because when I worked there, it was me and three other, two other paralegals. So there was three of us handling all of the work for about 15 lawyers. And one of the women killed herself and the other woman quit because the other lady killed herself and it was like really traumatic for our whole law firm. Um, so that was something that was really hard for me to deal with as like a 19, 20 year old that like the lady who mentored me ended up committing suicide. Um, anyways, so the... I just want to hold space for that, me in that moment. That was very hard. And it also showed me the emotional maturity of my boss at the time, because the same day that we went to her funeral, he 
made me stay like come from her funeral and go back to work because he was like our cases are more important than your grieving and I was like this is out of alignment with my value system but I at the time needed the job so I did it and um what became very apparent for me so basically they didn't hire any other paralegals I was doing what was the capacity for three people of the work and I organized everything to the point where it was like a really good system so we didn't need to hire more people uh, he didn't pay me more for this he was just like great keep doing the work you know and then we would have I had a dream to go to law school but I couldn't afford it and the um, the grant money was not going to pay for it and at the time yeah I just couldn't afford it <laughs> like straight up like in the states like law school is like over 100k um, $100,000 and so and I could have gotten a loan of course but I was like seeing all of my friends who were getting these student loans and just being so upset about it that basically they call it golden handcuffs where you have to be in your job for the X amount of 10 years at least to pay off of your student loans while you're getting a mortgage on a house, while you buy a car, while you then have kids. And it's just like the matrix like gets you in deeper, deeper, deeper. And I was like, no, I'm trying to leave this. Like my whole brain was like, I want to leave this whole society. Let's start something new. Um, but what happened was because I had been there for so many years and I was so quick was whenever someone would come out of law school, they would have me train them. So they would have me train the new attorneys that would come because I understood how everything worked and I understood law, like I had been studying it. And um, yeah, it was just interesting because basically what ended up happening was I was working as a lawyer without ever having the degree and they would like pay me better than a paralegal because I was doing work as a lawyer, but uh, I wasn't, the only difference between me and them was that I wasn't allowed to put my name on anything and obviously I didn't get paid what I was worth because in the work that I was doing, um, I wasn't, you know, whatever. So I, I, for me, it's more about like my brain needs to be activated. And so I was just excited to be doing new things and just be growing in my experience. And then I, um, I had had a, um, a therapist for three years. So this, this one job lasted a couple of years. And during that time, I got a therapist and I realized, oh, wow, I'm in a cult. And oh, wow, I don't want to be married anymore. And oh, wow, I want to like, make my life better. And I want to work remotely and travel the world like I've always said I wanted to do. And I had always told my ex-husband, like, I want to travel. I want to travel. And he um, does not have as expansive as a mindset as me. And so he was always like, you should just be happy with what we have and, you know, da, da, da. And I was like, I am happy for, with what we have. And I also see myself having a lot more. I have an expansive mindset and I am willing to work for it and I'm willing to go after it, you know, like lean into the fear of the unknown. And he was not. So anyways, I ended up leaving my religion and leaving my marriage and my ex-husband and I were, um, I knew I wanted to get divorced like from the moment I told him, but my therapist recommended that we give it six months just so he could get used to the idea. Um, and I was willing to do that. So within those six months period, I got very firm on the fact that I had always wanted to live in Costa Rica. And I was just like, um, I'm going to make this happen. So I talked to, I, and I already been talking to my boss for a long time. Like I want to work in Costa Rica, but this is like, this is like, when did I get, 2012, maybe 2013. So like remote work was not a thing, especially within the legal field. Like it's like very illegal to like work outside of your jurisdiction, um, technically, you know, even though people can do it, but they're not allowed to like report that they were doing any work, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of laws and boxes and all these things. And I was like, yeah, but I can just tell people I'm still in the States. Like, they don't need to know where I'm doing my work from. And then I realized that even, like, for the amount of work that I was doing and the fact that I was doing, like, three people's jobs in one and working as a lawyer, like, doing the work as if I was a lawyer but not getting paid. Basically, the price gap of what I was getting paid and the energy that I was putting out and the work ethic that I was putting out, the quality of work was not matching up. And I was in this big mode of expansion in my life of like, I don't give a fuck. This is my value system. This is what I'm worth. And I asked the universe to reward me and to like 
reflect back to me what I am worth. And so I went and told my, um, I, t- I went to my boss and I said, look, this is like how much work I do for you. This is what, how much I make for you. And this is how much you're saving by not hiring new people or new attorneys, like new paralegals or new attorneys. And this is what I, this is also the market rate that I should be getting for the amount of years and the whatever. And like, I'm asking for this raise. And he said, um, can you give me a week to think about it? And I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, that's valid. I'll give you a week. And then I talked to one of the other partners and he told me, oh, Brittany, he's just trying to keep you here longer. I already talked to him. He's not going to give you more money because uh, he's like stingy like that. But he also doesn't want to get rid of you. So he's going to try and string you along as much as possible. And I was like, fuck that. So I immediately started interviewing other places within the same city. At the time, I was living in Salt Lake City, Utah, which is such a random place. But my ex is from there and um, my ex-husband. And... Um, I got a bunch of interviews right away because of me being me and also my CV, my resume looked really good. And one of them was like, we need um, a head of our office, like not just a paralegal, but like the head of the whole office. And I told them straight up, I was like, I know how to work as an, and I know how to work as a lawyer. So if you need me to do this work, I'm happy to do it like, you know, below the surface and it will save you on hiring another attorney because you can just put your name on it. And also I want to be compensated for this. I want to be paid, you know, maybe not as much as an actual lawyer who went to law school, but I want to be paid way more than what a paralegal would because I can do the work. And he was like, great, yeah, I, I totally, like I totally see you, I honor this and here's my offer. And it was $20,000 more than what I was making in that time. So within, and that was like three days after I'd had this conversation with my current boss. So um, I remember going, because my ex-husband and I, we were separated at the time, but we would meet up once a week to just like check in and make sure each other was okay. And I told him, I was like, yeah, I started interviewing at other places um, because I feel like my current job is not giving me what I'm worth. And he was like, you should just be happy with what you have. Like, don't, don't ask for more. Like, you should just be happy that they even are giving you a job. And then I said to him, I was like, Ryan, I went and applied and I interviewed and now I'm getting a $20,000 raise. And he was like, uh, like like he, I think I frazzled his brain. He didn't know how to compute this because I was like, I asked for more from the universe. I was very grounded in my worth and I went out and I did stuff in the world and look at what got reflected back a lot more money and a better working environment where they really valued me. They let me work from home. They let me bring my dog to work. I had my own office in there and she would have her own little bed. And whenever I was in meetings, she would have to stay in my personal office and she would put her little paws up against the door frame and just kind of peek out. And I'd be like, nope, go back in. She was a really smart dog. She was a German shepherd, Australian shepherd mix. And so it was just like, and this law firm was like family, you know, like I really cared about them. They really cared about me. Um, it was just such an upgrade in so many ways. And it's because I allowed myself to think bigger, feel like I deserved more, open myself up to receiving more from the universe. And I fucking went out there and I did things. I stepped into the unknown. It's very scary to step into the unknown because something I didn't say before is like when you start, especially in law firms within a city, everyone knows everyone. So the fact that I started interviewing meant that my original law firm, they knew that I would, I was starting to interview And so it's like politics, you know, so you're already rocking the boat by putting yourself out there. And so, of course, there was this fear that I could have let take over, like, oh, if my original boss finds out that I'm interviewing, you know, maybe he'll let me go or like da da da. But that would be me not honoring my worth. And I knew what I was worth. I knew he did not want to let me go because then he would have to hire three more people and maybe more attorneys because I was doing every all this work for him. Um, So anyways, I went back and I, I, I immediately like quit my job and started at the other firm. And I worked there for a couple more months. So I was in the six month, you know, separation period with my ex-husband. And the moment that our divorce went through, our divorce took one week to process because I was able to do things as if I was a lawyer and I expedited it. It It's like the fastest divorce in the history. And I took on all the debt. I was just like, I want this to be done. I don't because my ex didn't want to get divorced. He wanted to make babies and stay in the same place he grew up in, in Salt Lake. And I was like, I'm getting the fuck out of here. Bye. So when I was free from that, I realized, okay, I could sit here and make a lot of money. I have very low living expenses. 
um, and I would have a very comfortable life here in Salt Lake City, which is like not a place I want to live. And for various reasons, it's like a Mormon place. Culturally, it's just very enclosed. It's not near the beach, like all the things, you know, all the things that make Brittany happy. It was none of those things. And then it was an interesting place to realize who I was, right? Because it was so in contrast to who I was that I was able to recognize exactly what I wanted. Sometimes the universe will give you what you don't want so that you can reaffirm what you actually need and want out of life. And it's up to you to go get it. It's up to you to believe that you are deserved, deserving and worthy of all the things that you crave. Because you really are. You are, it's... Life is one big game with yourself. I actually turned the volume up. One second. I got a little excited. <laughs> so life is one big game with yourself. And as that bike, you know, just reaffirmed. Um, anyways, so I had this kind of like, as we say in my religion, a come to Jesus moment where I was divorced, I was free, and I was like, I want to get out of here. Like, I have waited so long. I've been married for six years. I knew after one year I didn't want to be married, and I had to take all that time to allow myself to deprogram from all this conditioning of what it meant to be in my religion, what it means to be a wife, what it meant to be married. Like... And when I let all of that go and I was free, the thing that I knew the most clear was I wanted to live outside the country. I never really resonated as an American. Like even when I travel, people don't think I'm American. Um, just culturally, I, I, I am just not very American. I don't know how to say it. Um, anyway, so I talked to my, my new boss. I'd only been working for him for like a couple months, but he loved me. And I said to him, look, I'm going through a divorce. He already knew this. And I said, I said, I really want to live in Costa Rica. And I don't know how long for, but at least like six months. And like, I have the savings for like, basically I'm going, I'm going, I need to go. I'm having like a midlife crisis at 24 years old. I got to go or 23, whatever. I was like, I need to get out of here. And, you know, you can have me keep working for you. I would love to keep working for you. I feel like you're a part of my family. And uh, also, I understand if you don't want to, because I've been trying to have a lot of law firms, like the last one I'd worked for, like I've been trying to get them to let me work remotely and they didn't want to, right? So he was like, oh, okay, Brittany, you know, I love you. Let's try and make this work. Like he was a really, he is a very good man. Um, his name is Richard Bateman. I really honor you, Richard Bateman. Thank you for being fine masculine in my life. Um, and so I moved in 2014 to Costa Rica and I worked online. I don't know where I was, but basically I moved to Costa Rica and um, it was really funny because again, this is like 2013, 2014 when remote work was not a thing. Uh, I, I lived in a little surf town right below Tamarindo, which is like a major tourist spot in Costa Rica. And I was like this crazy girl just running around trying to find Wi-Fi all the time. So that, cause I was working like eight hours a day. I wasn't like, Oh, I'm working, you know, part time. I was like, no, I, I have to get things done, you know? And so I remember there was only one, like my, all of the places I stayed, they kept saying they had good Wi-Fi, and they didn't. Um, it was like enough to like, you know, send a message to your mom that you're alive back home, but it wasn't enough for me to like do the legal work that I need to do and like upload files and download things and do Skype calls with my team and blah, blah, blah. So I found this hotel and I became really good friends with the people who owned it, this, this uh, Costa Rican family. And they're amazing. Many stories I could say about them. Um, one thing I feel like as I've traveled to all these countries is like I really find my soul family within the local community and they really treat me like family, you know, like they show up for me and there's just this way about them where we just, it's immediate community and like I see you, you see me, let's help each other out. And so that was this family. And they had this outdoor, so it's a hotel that was like 10 minute drive from my house and they had an outdoor just sitting area like a cafe and it had a really good wi-fi so i would sit there sometimes for eight hours a day again this is open air a hundred percent humidity with a fan going but i was just dripping with sweat most of the time like i was just like staring at my computer all day just like oh this sucks you know um but i did it because i loved 
the idea and just the being away from everything. Wow, like the space that I was giving myself to really um, integrate leaving my religion, leaving my ex-husband and leaving my country like all in one was I needed that space and this was a very safe place Costa Rica is a super safe place it's like within America it's kind of like nowadays going to Mexico like there's this it's a lot of marketing around Costa Rica as like a tourist destination so and it for me it was good because it was the same time zone as my firm so I was able to do Skype calls with them and I think it was only like one hour off or something and they would bring again remember remote work is a very new thing right so they would like bring me in to the conference meetings with my team on a skype laptop like on a laptop and i'd be like hi everyone i'm here and like yeah there's the beach and da 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 and everyone was super jealous because they really wanted me to they wanted to come they wanted my life right which i understand and with my attorney that I worked for, he was like, look, Brittany, I love that you're doing this. I'm happy that I was able to give you this opportunity. But the idea behind everyone letting me work remotely, I've started to realize over many times trying to work remotely in the future after this as uh, a legal, like working in the legal field was they love the idea of giving you the short time to work remotely. But this is like, again, this is way back in the day, like 2013. This is like 10 years ago, right? So they, it was not in their mental construct that remote work was a viable long-term solution. They wanted you in the office. They wanted you in the meetings. They wanted you, you know, to be available all the time. And so... Uh, he was like, I, I need you to come back to the office like after your little stint here, you know? And I was like, I don't think you understand. I'm not coming back. And not only that, I was like, I am never going to live in Utah again. And I never did. And right before I went out to Costa Rica, I went to New York City. This is also something to know about me is I'm very good at like booking flights. This is feeds later to my story about me having a travel company was um, I found a flight that where it was cheaper for me to do a couple day layover in New York City than to f like on my way to Costa Rica than to fly directly to Costa Rica. I don't know why, but then something in the universe was like, go to New York City. So I went there for a couple days and um, I'd only been there once before as a teenager with my family. But I, at the time I really like there's a thing in the States where if you grow up on the West Coast, you want to live on the East Coast. And if you grow up on the East Coast, you want to live on the West Coast. Like everyone wants to try what they're not used to. And so I always had it in my mind, I want to live in New York City. Wow, this is amazing. This, you know, what a place to live. And it's like so much money to be made and so culturally diverse. And it's just like popping, you know, there's a lot of energy here. And so um, I met a guy when I was in New York, as I do. And he... Um, you know, we had a little romantic thing, but we didn't end up making love or anything. And then he ended up coming to Costa Rica and visiting me. And he was like, you know, he's an artist. Uh, he was friends with like Banksy. Like he did like, uh, like, you know, street, street graffiti art and all this stuff in the graffiti world. I don't know, all that stuff, you know, street art, which I thought was really cool. It wasn't like my thing, but I appreciated that he was successful in this and that he had done what he wanted in the world and you know was doing his thing and was independent and I do love artistic men anyway so he was like if you ever want to live in New York you're always welcome to live with me and if you ever wanted to like work with me and do art stuff like I could always use the help um because at the time his business was going really well it was expanding really quickly and I was like yeah yeah in my head I was like yeah it's because you want to fuck me <laughs> you know like I'm not stupid and at the same time when I was in Costa Rica after he left I kept thinking okay if I go back to Salt Lake I'm going to be living the normal life I'm going to be back in the matrix doing like the nine to five and um I need so what I ended up doing was uh, quitting my law firm while I was still in Costa Rica because I needed time to just grieve my marriage, my life, losing my whole community, like my, all of my family, all of my friends wouldn't speak to me anymore because I left their religion. And I was, it was kind of like a death cycle, you know, I'm a Scorpio, I need the Phoenix rise, but I had to let this all die first. So I told the guy I was working for, I was like, look, I just need some time for myself. Like, I'm sorry, I just, I cannot function. I was hitting this point where I was just crying all day long and I couldn't work and I was putting it off and I wasn't, I kept telling myself, I'll make up for it, I'll do it tomorrow. And then it just was getting, the, the workload was getting stacked and it wasn't happening. And so I had to be humble about it that I just needed some time, you know, I needed to be my feminine, I need to feel my feelings. 
and uh, he honored that. He understood. Of course, he was sad. Um, and a part of this, too, was because um, while this guy was visiting me from New York, I knocked a whole cup of water on my brand new MacBook, and I couldn't work. Uh, and this is, feeds into the story with this family with the hotel is they let me borrow like a Spanish, uh, I just remember it was a laptop with a Spanish keyboard and I was able to figure out how to like remote in from this laptop and work. But it was like, it was like the universe was like, you need to slow down. We're making it impossible for you to work. And I just kept going like, I'm going to make it work. I'm going to keep going. And then emotionally, I just hit this wall where I was like, okay, I can't do this anymore. So I quit that and I, um, I had a car and I drove all over Costa Rica, Nicaragua and Panama by myself. And this was also a really big moment for me like as a 24 year old single woman you know who was raised in a reality where everything's unsafe and you know you need to be with your husband the whole time and like basically being alone as a single woman is like the most dangerous thing in the world and I'm driving across Costa Rica where it's like full remote jungle and there's no reception for like three hours in the middle and it's just like these misty curvy jungle roads I remember like stopping in the middle of one one time and just crying because I was so I felt so free I was like yeah on the one hand I could be scared no one knows where I am I could my car could break down and like I would be hours before someone came on this road and found me on the other hand I'm gonna be fine I have a full trust in the universe that everything is okay everything's happening for me and this is just all one big adventure and I'm on like one of the best parts of my adventure right now and I really could feel that and I was owning it and I would stay in like hostels just to like get community and stuff and I would meet all these girls that were like 17 18 years old and at the time they, I looked like this wise older girl to them because it's like wow she has a car she has a job or I had a job but I had enough savings to just quit my job and travel and I remember th and they were like oh we could never do that we're just coming here with our girlfriends for a short trip but we're basically going to go back and live the normal life and I, I started having this idea brew in me like I want to help people break out of this matrix nine to five. Like I want to create safety, especially for women when they're traveling, where they can feel like they're in community and they can do their thing, you know, like they can work and make money online and they can, um, and they can explore the world, you know, in community and doing it together. So um, this idea was brewing also with the fact that I realized that in order for me to really break out of the matrix, I was on my savings. Like, I, don't know, my, I was using my savings on this trip when I wasn't working. And I was like, I need more money. Like basically like if the matrix or a normal nine to five job is like this cruise ship, I needed to build my life raft in order to get off the cruise ship. Otherwise I was just gonna jump in the sea and drown because I didn't have the resources, the money, and I didn't have like what it needed in order to like really break free from it. Um, so in my brain, my little clever brain, it was like, okay, where can I go right now within my expansive mindset? Where is best for me to go to make the most amount of money and meet inspiring, amazing people who are moving and shaking things in the world and also build this life raft, it's basically build a business where I can get out of my nine to five job. And then this offer came to come stay in New York with this guy. And I was like, okay, maybe this is like what I'm meant to do, you know? Of course, there's many different timelines and in staying with this guy ended up being a very bad thing. I had to get a restraining order against him. He was stalking me. It was really traumatic in one way. In another way, uh, I was able to move to New York and, and I wasn't freeloading from this guy. Like he made me pay half the rent, pay for my way the whole time. Um, and also wanted to date me and we dated for like a very short time and I realized like no this is not going to work so then we like broke up but it's New York City and so it took me a while to find an apartment that I could afford and I ended up moving out actually I remember like so I got I got a law firm job got one of the highest paying law firm jobs that I could find and um I was also like, okay, I need to live on my own because this living situation is not good. And this is when I met Michaela, who I have talked about in many of my podcasts. Um, but she like, we met in a group therapy session. Uh, it was like um, Codependence Anonymous or something. It was like an offshoot from Alcoholics Anonymous. And I just looked at her and we looked at each other and I was like, do you want to go get a coffee after this? Because we were just like, <laughs> it was just really funny. It was like, we were in like the Hasidic part of town and uh, we were the only people in this um, 
group therapy that were not Hasidic Jewish women. <laughs> and it was just like, we were both looking at each other like, how did we get here? Like, what are we doing? <laughs> um, so anyways, we went and got a coffee and uh, I was very open with her about my living situation and stuff. And like in New York, people do not trust each other. Like, even if you know someone for years, they're not going to like offer for you to come stay at their house. You know, it's like there's this big, very big wall and barrier people put up because it, it's a hard life there. It's hard to make it work. And after knowing each other for like two weeks, she offered for me to stay with her. I remember it was like, a th it was Thanksgiving, which is a huge holiday in the States. And she was like, I want you to come stay with me. This living situation is super abusive. It's toxic. You need to get out. So I ended up moving in with her after knowing her for two weeks. And I lived there for like another two weeks, I think, until I was able to find a place. And I ended up, anyways, I'm just saying that I'm very grateful to Michaela. And also, I want to say this to you that like, if you really put yourself out there and you trust and you follow your intuition, it will guide you to the people who are meant to be in your life. Like maybe this guy was meant to be in my life so I could get to New York. I'm sure there was another timeline where it felt better in my body. Uh, I didn't have to date him. He would have been fine with me living with him and just paying half the rent. Um, but also I wanted to explore. I, I like to have experiences. So this was one more experience that I had. Um, and also Michaela showed up in my life in exactly the moment that I needed. And it was such a lifesaver. And then I ended up finding a beautiful apartment on something called Craigslist, which is like in the States, it's kind of a joke. It's become such a scam place that when I tell people I found an apartment on Craigslist, they're like, don't give them your money. Like this is going to be super shady. And it ended up being like the most beautiful apartment with like, like luxury furniture. And my housemate, her name is, is Netta. We're still friends to this day. She uh, was a doctor in Iran and, um, it was up in Harlem, like on the upper Manhattan. And um, it was just, it was like, okay, so the, the place that I lived ended up being like a version of Friends, you know, like Friends the episode where everyone has different apartments. So it was like this four story brownstone where there's four apartments and me being me, I go and meet all the neighbors and we all become friends. And then like every Saturday morning, it's like we have a group chat and whose house are we going to make brunch in? And so every Saturday morning and also throughout the week, we're all like just going in and out of each other's apartments and stuff. And the guy who owned our apartment was like this crazy French guy who like just made a bunch of money doing something random. I don't know if it was with drugs or something, but he bought our apartment and like made it beautiful and like luxurious and then like moved off because he married a model somewhere. It was all, it really was like a movie and he would just pop in randomly um, like throughout the time I was living there and like make us crepes and we'd all hang out and it was just really funny. And um, so this became like my little community family, like while I was dealing with a lot of stuff with my religion and, and also like just trying to make it work in New York City. And so for me, back to like, how was I able to travel to all these countries was I would, I had a goal of how much money I wanted in my savings account. And I'd also taken on, remember I said I'd taken on the debt of my divorce. So I'd taken on whatever debt we had. And so I had the debt that I needed to pay off and I had the money that I needed to make. And I had the sticky note on my desk at work that people didn't understand what it was, but it was basically plus and minus. And it was like how much money I had in my bank account and how much money I needed to pay off. And every week I would get paid direct deposit and I would be like, okay, putting money here, putting money here. I would bring my lunch to work every single day. I would only get coffee like outside of the office on Fridays. I really had a mission. You know, I went into what I call mission mode of like, I'm getting the fuck out of here. And this is all for a purpose. And it's not, I'm not suffering. I was having fun with it. Like, because as my friends were at work, I had, I had a really good crew of girlfriends at work. And like, they would all be complaining about their mortgages and how much bills they had. But then they're paying, they're spending like $30 at lunch and another like, $50 on shopping. It's like they hated their lives and they hated that they were stuck in this loop. This is why we call it golden handcuffs because they felt constricted that he felt like they weren't living the life they wanted, but they didn't have the, the idea that they could get out. And so they would just buy things to comfort themselves, which again would dig them deeper into the, I need to be in this life in order to pay for everything. So it's this vicious loop. And I saw all of it. I was like, I'm getting out of this thing. I'm getting out. I'm getting out. I'm getting out. Um, and I had um, the guy that I dated after I broke up with my ex-husband. He lived in, he's from Salt Lake City and he ended up moving to New York and moving in with me. And um, 
it was such an interesting dynamic because we were mostly just friends and we were like friends fa family like soul family and we were both like in this mode where we were really trying to figure out what we were doing with our life next he really wanted to date me and move back to salt lake and i was like i just got out of that place i'm not going back um and he had launched um an impact hub which is a co-working space in salt lake and he was very much in the co-working scene so when i was living in salt lake i got into it with him and i understood like oh wow this is such a beautiful place for community and for entrepreneurs and i didn't understand about like remote workers yet until i became one and so he was in this scene and knew a bunch of people around the world who were um, launching co-working spaces it was a very new market in 2014 and he was like um just connected with a lot of people who were also launching co-living spaces which i had just learned through him what was which was like oh this is people who work remotely and they choose to live in a different country in this like co-living environment where they rent a room and they have like a shared space where they can work together and then they have their community and i was like wow that's really beautiful i want to make something like that and so he connected me with two german people um, who had the same idea. So I had this idea, like I wanted to create a travel company where people would pay kind of like a membership fee, like a like their rent or something. And we would provide where they're staying, their membership to a co-working space. And then we would plan fun things to do on the weekend. And they, if they wanted to come, they would pay extra to do those things, like, you know, explore the city that we were in or whatever. And I, I wanted to do it with just women because that was like, I always want to empower women. And so... Um, his name's Ryan, the guy that, um, I don't know if we were dating. I can't remember at this point. At the time, I was still trying to get reinstated in my religion so I could get back with my family. So what's really interesting about my life is there's many different timelines happening all at once, and it could take hours to explain each one, and they were all happening at once in my life. So in this very specific moment, I was trying to not sleep with Ryan because I was trying to get what's called reinstated in my religion so I could talk to my family. So we were living together but trying not to sleep together, but we were supporting each other. And then there's the timeline of my work where I was trying to make something so I could get out of the city. And then there's the timeline of just me and my emotional capacity of like, what the fuck? I'm, li I'm like one of the most sensitive creatures ever going an hour and a half on the train each way to work in such a loud city. And my nervous system is just so overactivated and overstimulated to the point where I got um, what's called shingles, where it's a, it's a nervous system like... It's basically a rash that shows up on one side of your body and it's caused by extreme amounts of stress. And usually only old people and people with cancer get this. I learned this from my doctor when I went in and she was like, you have such extreme amounts of stress in your life. You need to change something about your life because of like, she gave me medication for it, but she was like, if you hadn't come in and it reaches the other part of your body, because it shows up on one part of your body, then you can potentially die from this. And she's like, this is just from stress. So I was in this very emotionally stressful situation. Um, anyways, so Ryan told me, he was like, yeah, I think it's great that you want to help women, but from a marketplace standpoint, like just having a, um, he was like, right now, because remote work is so new and because where the market is at, like just having it for women, it's going to be a lot harder to enter the market. So like, why don't you first start off with doing it for both men and women? Because most of your first cu customers are going to be men because they're just traditionally um, programming wise, like feel safer to travel and I was like yeah but that's the point I'm trying to help women feel safe and he's like yes but you also need to have a company where it makes money and I was like okay fine so he was like I I want to connect you with two of these German people who have the same idea as you so at the time there was only co-working spaces where you know you work from a space and co-living spaces which is just in one location like I have um you know a house in Switzerland and I'm opening this space where people can come I wanted to do something where I could travel so we came up with the concept to do a country a month around the world and um and basically like it's like a pop-up co-living community so we would take over a castle um or a mansion in sicily one time we took over an apartment complex in berlin you know like we would take over these like areas and there'd be like 30 to 40 of us and people could come on and off like for as long as they wanted they could come a month at a time and we would just be like this little community, this little family where everyone would have their own remote jobs. They would pay us this membership fee per month. 
and we would take care of the Wi-Fi, where they're staying, their connection to the co-working space. And again, at the time, like when we fully launched this, by this time I was living in New York for like a year and a half. And so um, this is 2016. And especially in Europe, like in the States, co-working spaces were popping off, but like in Europe, it was still a very new concept. So a lot of the places, and in South America also, so a lot of the places we went to, like people would put us on the news, that we'd be on the radio, would be like this, we'd just be like taking over the town energetically or wherever we were. I remember specifically one time in Croatia, they were just so excited for us to be there. It was like they would give us, roll out the red carpet of like, you know, all these international people working remotely. What are they doing? What's remote work? Da, 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 you know? So, and a lot of these, and also the, the co-working spaces, they didn't really understand how to cater to foreigners. They had really only, you know, operated within helping people from their own culture. So what I found interesting was to go ahead, I would go ahead of the group, like, a, you know, we would be in one country and I would go two weeks ahead of time and find, or maybe a month ahead of time and find where we're going to stay the next month and set up where we're going to stay at the co-working space and just like scout things out. I loved this. I loved this so much. And what I also really enjoyed was working with the local community and the co-working space and educating them like, hey, you can have this life too. You know, this is how we operate. And, and also helping the, the co-working space understand how to cater to our needs. Like what do, what do digital nomads actually want? Like digital nomad was not a word. I remember... Um, when I told my boss in New York that I was leaving, they, she wasn't very nice to me. Um, and she was just like, basically kind of the idea, like, yeah, let's see if this works, you know, like there's many startups in the world that don't work. And I, and I, cause I gave her like a couple weeks notice before I left. And I remember the week I was leaving and I sent out, cause I just said to her, but I hadn't let the rest of my office know. So when I sent out the email to the rest of my office, we had gotten the New York Times. Um, it's like this new thing of co-living things popping up and digital nomad things. I remember sending the the, email, uh, the link to the article in my email like, hey guys, this is what I built and this is what I'm doing now and see you later. And everyone was like, what? Brittany's gonna go travel the world? And I was like, yep, I'm going. I feel like I've been this internal spy just like on a mission like to gather my resources so I could like, you know, build my life raft to get out of here. Uh, and I'm still friends with a lot of the people from that office to this day. I remember when I went back to New York right before COVID, I met up with a bunch of them. It was really fun. Um, so anyways, I started traveling with the company and um, this is there's a couple of funny things in this story. I don't know how much I want to go into it, but basically like I came on in my reality as a co-founder and put in my own energy, my own resources and the other two people, we, I had us incorporate in the States. Um, and um, <laughs> I'm not going to go into it. It doesn't really matter. But basically, we had, we had differences of opinion of how to run the company and what it meant to be a co-founder. And I just said to them, I was like, you know what? I want to do big things in the world. I don't want this just to be a travel company that pays for my next flight. I want to expand to like whatever I touch turns to gold and I want to, I want to do more than this. And, um, they wanted it to just be this kind of lifestyle company, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and also they, it was like, suddenly they wanted me to put more of my money into it and felt like, you know, in order to claim true co-foundership, I needed to do da da da. And I was like, no, you know, you don't understand. We're incorporated in the States. I have a legal background. I understand how business works. And I could cut this down in like two seconds. And at the same time, I have this very wise old soul in me that is like, this is not worth my energy. I'm not going to feel disempowered by this. This is the universe telling me that there's something bigger out there for me. So I said to them, look, give me my equity that I put into this. I'm going to walk away. And um, to this day, they still claim that I wasn't a co-founder, which I find hilarious. Um, and that's okay. Like you can have differences of opinions and you can have different realities. And again, because I don't care, it doesn't bother me. Like it bothered me at the time for a little bit, of course, because I go so heart open into everything and so transparent and so much energy and love. Like if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it like a thousand percent, you know, and to feel this like betrayal in many different ways was like, 
oh, Brittany, you need to be a little bit more careful about where you put your energy, having better contracts. And it was one of those things where I came from a contract legal world into a startup world, thinking that people are going to honor themselves. And I want to give you a little tip of advice. Get everything written down. Have it signed by a lawyer. Also, even if you do all of that, sometimes shit happens and you need to just understand when it's important to walk away because you can fight it, but is it worth your energy? And a lot of times it's not worth the fighting. Sometimes if you need to show up and have boundaries, that's great. But for me, I already um, had many other things I was excited to work on. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to work on this anymore. And at the time we had just gotten to Chiang Mai as one of our locations, which is a city in the north of Thailand. And I immediately fell in love with uh, Chiang Mai. And the guy I was dating at the time was a software developer and he did like coding boot camps. And so I went to the main, um, so again, I'm, this is me following my excitement just naturally as I do. I went to the owners of the main co-working space in Chiang Mai called Pun Space. And I said to them, look, um, we want to um, use your conference room for a month so that we can do this coding boot camp." And I noticed that you are like the main co-working space in a, a, a very digital nomad hotspot town. Like if you know anything about remote working, Chiang Mai is a space that especially back in the day, a lot of people first started their digital nomad journey. And I was like, you're kind of this hub and you don't have any events. You know, like there's no community here at this co-working space. And they, so I said, how about we do an exchange where I organize events for your community here and we're going to be in the community while we're here and we get to use the conference room for free. And they were like, yeah, sure. Like, like, great, go for it. They're an amazing Thai couple. I really love them. And so they loved what I did that month and the community that I brought together very easily. And they, yeah, so they really liked me and they wanted me to, um, keep the community going so they were like can we pay you i think it was like one thousand five hundred dollars a month and this is in 2016 um to do i think it was two or three parties a month like two or three events a month where i brought the community together and i was like yes i accept this offer because it's like you know to get a a really nice place in chiang mai is like three hundred dollars a month like a, a really nice condo so the living expense is very low. And for me, organizing a party is something I already did for my travel company. And I just do in my life naturally, bringing people together. Um, so organizing three a month, I was like, I could do so many more things. And I did a lot of other things on the side, but that was the main thing I would do every month. And then we started working together more, me and the owners, and they were like, look, we wanna expand to like two more locations in the city. Our family has property and we wanna grow. Like, can you help us do this? And I was like, yeah, sure. So. We eventually ended up having like three different locations and it was all Thai employees and I would manage all of them. So I'd like be going in, in between all of them and also running the communities. And it was really fun. I, w I really loved it. Like, um, and then I was organizing parties for the community on the side, like just like New Year's Eve parties, Christmas parties, just like festivals. I organized a women's festival in Chiang Mai. That was really fun and it was all like, it was, everyone was invited, but it was completely women led and organized. And I had like 10 women on my board, a team, my team leading it with me and just really beautiful community impact stuff that I was doing in the city. And it got to the point where I was, uh, people just knew me in the city so much that people started um, asking if I could come do a video of their, like come and eat at their restaurant, make a video and post it on like the Facebook groups that were in the in the city and they would pay me like three hundred dollars to do this. And again, this is back in like 2016, 2017. And I was like, the whole time I'm like, why are people paying me for this? Like I always I just found it always like really funny. So not like funny haha, but like just laughing at the irony of life. So when people ask me like what do you do for work? I'm like, I literally just be myself and all of these opportunities come my way so I was basically like an influencer for Chiang Mai and there's a tourism board um, like for every country and within Chiang Mai like the head of the tourism board of Thailand she was like an auntie to me she loved me and whenever she would like have to do like UNESCO world heritage inaugurations she'd get invited to come to a speech and I would be like her plus one and then I ended up getting like involved with the there's many stories I could share but Chiang Mai loves me I was like friends with the chief of police I was you know like so close with this lady who was the tourism board of Thailand. So it was just like whatever I wanted to do, I played the game out to the max. I would host so many parties. 
um, where you know, I probably needed a lot of permits in the States and I probably need a lot of permits in Thailand. But for some reason, it was just I was so protected in the city, like energetically, the whole city just like opened its arms to me. And then <laughs> as it does, like I get very comfortable and then the universe is like, you need to be doing something new. So um, I. um well, wow, again, there's many, many layers to the story of different things of people I was dating, different things that were happening, heartbreaks. But I want to stick to like how I was able to travel and make money and keep going, right? So I'll stick on this timeline right now. So there was something um, started by a co-working space in Ubud called Hubud. It's a main co-working space. Uh, they've, they're closed now, but for many, like 10 years, they were like the main co-working space in Asia, honestly, because most people would go to Bali first. Um, and they started something called like Coworking Unconference Asia or something. And so they first did it, basically they were getting all the people who, who owns and ran co-working spaces and co-living spaces around Asia together at a conference in Bali. And that went on for a couple of years. And then they started touring where they would do every year a different country. And the first time they went on tour, they came to my space in Chiang Mai, my co-working space that I ran. And so people found out, they saw in person how it was able to expand the community from one location to three, how I ran the team, how I ran the whole community there. And they, like people started, and there was also people who came to this conference that wanted to launch a co-working space and they wanted help. So what happened was because we were hosting them in my city, there's over like 200 of these people at a conference, they started asking me, Brittany, can you come to, can you come to my country? Can I host you in my country and you launch my co-working space and do the first quarter, like the first three months, hire my team, launch the digital nomad community. And I was like, yeah, sure. So I went to Bali. I did this. I went to India. I went to a bunch of different countries around Asia. And it was really fun because it was like, you know, I just bop in and do my little fairy thing where I would, you know, launch the team. I would train them on how to handle foreigners, what they, what digital nomads needed, what remote, remote workers needed. And, and then, you know, and people would just like, I would like stay with people's families and really understand the culture from their perspective. I remember living with some families in India and just really loving it, loving being this like foreigner in a foreign land for me and just being able to put myself so deep in a deeply immersed in a culture where I was also able to contribute in the way that really resonated with me which was to help them build their community and like I really love like launching things like my brain works in this way like how do we put a system together that it's viable that's working and can work long term and also be malleable you know not so much structured in the masculine but like be flexible also in the feminine of how can we have the system be flexible enough that it can keep expanding? So my brain gets very nerdy about these things from a business perspective. And also from a community perspective, I just loved hosting the community, making people feel at home. Like, you know, people are so far away from their home and remote working at the time was so new. And so it was really a brave thing to go out in the world. It still is. Um, but especially back then, we really were like pioneering a lot of this stuff and like figuring it out as we went along. Um, and then um, the guy I was dating at the time, I don't, I don't want to go into that track, but there was the thing where I ended up going to San Francisco, San Francisco because a guy I was dating was onboarding for a job, the one that was a programmer. And then we ended up going back to London because he's from London and we broke up. I came back to uh, Asia because I was going to do another season at the co-working space in in Chiang Mai and I came back with so much energy so much fire like talking to my, my Thai team like let's we're gonna do this we're gonna launch a boot camp we're gonna do this we're gonna do that and um they went and told the owners uh some stuff and so <laughs> I just remember this day it was November 9th of I think 2017 or 2018 um and they sat me down and they were like the owners of this co-working space and they were like Brittany we love you we love how much you have done for us. And I'm like sitting there like wearing one of their t-shirts. Like, I'm so excited. I have so much energy. I have all these things I want to do with them. And they're like, we're going to have to let you go. And I was like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, I just came back here for this. And they're like, we'll pay you another couple months salary because we know this is a shock. But it's basically like our whole team is threatening to quit 
And I was like, why? I've been so nice to them. And they're like, they feel like you make them work too hard. <laughs> this is something I had to learn about Asian cultures. Is like basically they wanted to just be on Facebook all day long and do their like their one, two things that they were responsible for. And the fact that I came in with a very like West Coast entrepreneur, Silicon Valley mindset of like, we can do more, we can be productive. They did not like that. And so as happens, I've learned in Asia, they made a coup where they all threatened to quit. And um, the, the Thai couple that owned it, they were like, um, we want to keep working for you. But also, if you were ever to leave us, these are the team that's worked for us for like, you know, six, seven years. And so they're like, they're like, we're not going to lose them because, you know, we know you, Brittany, you're going to like flutter off and do more things, but we can't lose them. And I just remember being like, this is again, one of these moments where I'm like, okay, I can go into my contraction. I can be very upset. I ended up having a call with a friend that day. I remember it was November 9th because he told me, Brittany, you're going to remember this day and you're going to remember how much this was an opportunity for you to expand. I have amazing people in my life also. This has really helped me with my expansion. If you don't have these amazing people, I invite you to get them in your life and call them in because he was like, the universe wants you to expand into a bigger version of you to make more impact instead of just helping this one co-working space you can make more impact in the world so how can you step into this and i was like okay what can i do what is the universe asking me to do so i started launching uh, women entrepreneurship boot camps those were really fun um this is this is the timeline when i did the women's festival and then um i had someone come into my vortex again most most things just come to me so I had someone come into my vortex, this American guy who um, lived in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. It's the capital of Malaysia. And he said, Brittany, I found you. Many people told me I need to talk to you. And I was like, okay, what does this mean? Because I also did like business masterminds just for the community in general. And it was kind of this hub of like how when people first got to the city, like dropping in and meeting each other and getting some help on their startup. So he came to this one night and he was like, I have talked to many people about you. And I actually came to Chiang Mai because we need another um, consultant. I work at a consultancy firm in Kuala Lumpur. It's uh, owned by a guy from Copenhagen. It's all entrepreneurs and people who are foreigners. And we um, consult large corporations around Asia um, on how to have better values, you know, like um, basically like give them startup values. And this was like, just at the time it was super interesting for me because the that question I was asking myself is like how do I make more impact in the world and I had been working with entrepreneurs or remote workers for a couple of years and I was like yeah I'm helping like one or I don't know you know I was like am I making the impact I'm meant to make and this was an opportunity where I could potentially help like the people who ran like the head of Coca-Cola for Asia or like the head of this huge airline or you know the head of FedEx for Asia I could potentially you know, do business consulting for him, help him shape not just the, you know, the business development of his company, but also shape how he treats his, his employees to create a better work environment for them. So if I can impact him, that could potentially impact thousands of people and like make their lives better. The only thing was that I did not want to live in Kuala Lumpur. It is a Muslim country and I was like very hippie free, living my life in Chiang Mai. I wasn't, I hadn't gone to the island yet. I haven't been to Koh Phangan at this point, but I just knew that I didn't want to live in a huge city again. And so they kept giving me better and better offers and every month I would turn them down and say no. And then finally they said, okay, look, what if we pay to have you fly out for one week a month, you either come to our office in Kuala Lumpur or we'll send you on assignment to some country in Asia where you're working with these big um, companies and um, we'll give you like a flat rate salary plus all these benefits, right? And I was like, okay, it's a good chunk of money. I can make the impact I want to make and it's only one week a month. And so I did it. I said yes. And I worked for them for almost a year. And I would fly to Hong Kong, Singapore, Dubai, like I was in and out of Malaysia a lot. I was flying all over the place. Um, it ended up being more than a week a lot of times. And that was something that ended up being the reason why I quit because every time I got in my healthy workflow, whatever I was working on in Chiang Mai, um, in just my own lifestyle of like having my friends, my community, my boyfriend at the time, 
and then suddenly I would be, need to be gone for like a week or two at a time. And when I was away, I, yeah, I was making this impact, but my, my living, like how I felt in my body, it was like I was working 12 hour days and then going back to the hotel and like either hanging out by myself, calling my boyfriends or hanging out with one of my coworkers, which were friends, but they weren't like my soul family, you know? And I was like, what would it take for me to make the impact I want to make in the world while also living in a way where my body feels really good? you know, cause like it was a lot of stress. It was a lot of stress flying. It was a lot of stress, like being in these big cities. And of course, you know, it was fun. It felt like a movie. Like we just fly in as like these secret agents. And like, it felt like, you know, like we were doing these big missions and helping these big companies. Um, but after I was there for almost a year and I was like, I don't know how much impact we're actually making, you know? Um, and it doesn't actually matter how much impact we're making because the cost gain ratio of me making this impact is feeling not so great in my body. And also like, yeah, my body was just getting really tired from traveling so much. And also, you know, something I didn't mention in this whole conversation is that, um, from 2016 onward, I would base in Chiang Mai, but for half the year I would be traveling. So I would make like a loop around the whole world where I'd be like in South America, I, usually, honestly, I would go in between Europe and Asia, but sometimes I would be in South America. Um, but I was traveling a lot, a lot. And this is like uh, all of these things that I'm talking to you about were things that helped me fund the way that I was traveling. And um, a lot of my traveling around Asia was for different projects I was working on. So the projects would pay for my flights, pay for where I was living, pay for my travel expenses and also pay me. So, or my living expenses and also pay me. So, um, my stuff in Europe was mostly for fun. Like during the summer, I'd go see my friends. A lot of my friends ran the digital my communities in Europe and I would help them, help them with events, but it was mostly for fun and for exploring. Um, and I also had explored with my personal travel company when I had it, um, before I, before I based in Asia. Um, so fast forward, um, January of 2020, <laughs> I had just quit the consultancy firm that I worked for and I got a business class um, ticket. I got a one year flying business class for a year. A friend of mine worked for the air for airline and he was a very close friend of mine from high school. He worked for Delta and he got, they give you like this companion pass. So if you're not married, you can choose who you want to be as your plus one. And all they have to do is pay airport tax. So I could fly business class from Thailand to Rio for paying the airport tax of like $150. And I could fly unlimited, unlimited amounts of flying. I was very excited about this because I'd already traveled to so many countries and, um, and also at the time I just got a credit card that gave me VIP lounge access. So suddenly I was flying in luxury and between January and March of 2020, I flew from Thailand to the States. I went to New York and then I went down to Rio for carnival. And then I went back to New York. I was, so I was in Rio when they got their first case of COVID. I was in New York when they got the first case. I was in New York for my friend's birthday party. The last weekend that parties were illegal in New York before they shut everything down. I was on my way from New York to Egypt where I was about to consult and launch a co-living space on like some oasis in the desert. And on my layover, I was in Germany on my layover, they closed the borders to Egypt because there was a bunch of cases like going down the Nile River on this boat. I don't know if anyone remembers this, but it was a really big, I was paying attention to it because I was on my way to Egypt. Um, and I already had signed up and had my camp to go to what is Burning Man in South Africa. They call it Africa Burn. So that was supposed to happen in two months. And so I talked to the boyfriend I was dating at the time, like, what am I supposed to do? Because him and I were supposed to meet up in South Africa to go to Burning Man together. He was coming from Thailand. And he's like, just go, just reroute to South Africa. Let's just go there. I'll come now and we'll go there like a month early. So we get there. I was about to do some consulting for some corporations there. Uh, around like business development and different things and also organize a conference. There was a lot of different business things that I had going on. South Africa really loves me. I'd already been there a couple times. And so I had a lot of connections and I was in the city and I was like, let's go, let's do some business stuff. I'm here a month early. And I remember someone coming into the conference room and saying, they just got their first case of COVID here. 
and he the guy who said it he was like oh yeah it's not that big of a deal they'll they'll handle it and I was like no I know what's gonna happen uh I was like I went home I told my boyfriend we need to go home we need to go back to Thailand and within a week we were there for one more week they had they had canceled Africa burn it was not going to happen they had brought out army trucks in the street pointing guns at people to tell them to get inside like South Africa is already a super unsafe country and um they already have um energy like actual power energy restrictions where they like sell their power to outside the country so the people inside the country don't even have enough electricity so they were already having like electricity shortages they had food shortages and i was like this is not a place i'm gonna get locked down like no fucking way um so we got on one of the last planes back to thailand we got there two days before the country locked down and all of our friends there's a burning season not going to go into that but in the north where we lived we lived in the city in the north called Chiang Mai. there was a huge burning season the farmers were burning crops and so when that happens a lot of the people in Chiang Mai come down to this island Koh Panyong. and so all of our friends were here we ended up coming here and pretty soon after we got here my boyfriend and i broke up I got in my only ever scooter accident and I got dengue. And if you don't know what dengue is, it's like malaria. It's really bad. I've had COVID. Dengue is worse. They jokingly call dengue like the bone crushing disease because it really fucks you up and it makes you feel like your bones are crushing. And um, this was like hashtag the beginning of my spiritual awakening. Um, I was always very spiritual awake person, but I felt like this was the time for me to finally claim it on the external and like also shift everything I was doing in the external world because right when lockdown happened you know I was running around the world like promoting remote work for the last 10 years like on LinkedIn I was very active on LinkedIn about how remote work is the future of work and we need to give everyone the opportunity to work remotely well suddenly all of my all of my um a boyfriend and I that was a filmmaker for National Geographic like the year before we had gone on this trip all over Europe. I got a bunch of sponsorship. There's so many stories. I keep forgetting all the stories. We, I, I raised like $15,000 in sponsorship and we made a YouTube series about how remote work is the future. This is the year before COVID. And we went to all my friends' co-living spaces and showed how it was to work remotely, what you needed to do to remote, work remotely, what the community is like. So fast forward one year, 2020, me on the islands, these videos on YouTube blow up and so many companies are messaging me saying we need your help our whole team is forced to work remotely now we have no systems in place we don't know how to run the community and you seem like you know what you're doing so suddenly I had like I was working like 12 hours a day but the universe wanted me to stop that so I got in the scooter accident I got dengue and I had a heartbreak all at once and I remember talking to my godparents at the time like Richard and Heather and I was like they were asking me, when was the last time that you just took a month off and you didn't work? And I was like, maybe I, like since I was 18, you know, like I've always needed to work. I've always needed to move. I mean, because I have so much energy and also because I want to make an impact and also because I don't have family support. So, you know, all these people who have run out of money and go home to their families, I don't have that option. So here I am working all the time. It was a scarcity mindset. Um, and they said, why don't you just take a month off? It looks like you don't actually don't have a choice. And I was like, okay. So I took a month off. And in doing that, of course, the island opened itself. And I was able to um, understand that I ended up doing ayahuasca. I was able to understand that, like, yeah, the reason why I loved co-working so much in these co-living spaces was because I loved community. I, I wanted to make a new earth community that I feel safe to have my own babies into one day. And it matters less to me about people working remotely and more to me about having like my vision, like I can feel things coming. I could feel that COVID was coming. I'm rising Aquarius. I can feel things coming in the world. I can feel what's happening on the horizon. Rising Aquarius means like you can look into the future and you can feel what the collective is going to do next, what it needs next, and you just start building naturally. So a lot of the stuff I was doing subconsciously. Well, right when COVID hit, the thing that was like, like I could feel COVID coming and the next thing I could feel coming was there's going to be a time in the future when we are all going to want to live within a community and do our best to grow our own food and live near each other and like go back to this tribal setting. 
and it might not be our choice it might be what's happening in the world that's forcing us to do this so why don't we make it our choice and actually learn the tools that we need now to build something that's sustainable well because during covid the island was locked so you could leave the island but you couldn't come to the island and there was only like a small amount of us foreigners left that didn't go home uh, and we didn't have covid on the island so if you closed your phone covid didn't exist but they made us um, follow the regulations for the whole country, which was like you couldn't meet in groups of more than two people. You couldn't use yoga shalas. You couldn't meet and like you couldn't do any events, you know, workshop events. No. So the boyfriend I had at the time, we made a lot of money on crypto. He was a crypto trader. And we rented a, this space, the collective, remote collective, and we made it into a community space. So no, we didn't live here. We lived on the beach. We had two villas next to each other on the beach. And... We just turned this into a full community space. And I asked the owner, I said, can we do events here? And she said, I don't care. You can do whatever you want. Just hide your bikes because our driveway, you can hide the bikes so people can't see how many people are here. And so we had all of our friends that were facilitators on the island come together and they would just pitch in a little bit of money to pay for the rent. So it didn't end up making us any money, but we did it for the community. And we had like a schedule and um, we had like three events a day. So we did everything from like kids summer camps to cooking classes to connection events to this is how the play party started to cuddle events to nonviolent communication and tantra stuff and just anything the community needed it was like a space for that right so um it was really beautiful and this went on for two years and wow it's starting to rain a lot right now wow 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 so um torrential downpour um okay moss what more um so this was the first time like up until this point i had already traveled to almost 70 countries um but of course there was more i wanted to see and i actually felt very like locked here on the island i felt like i didn't want to get out i'm getting bored you know even when you live in paradise you can get bored just letting you know i did it it happens um, because I like to travel, I like to see new things, and I just love to explore, you know, my midheaven and my Venus are both in Sagittarius, which is like the explorer, I like to be out, like, you know, understanding how cultures work, learning new languages, falling in love with beautiful foreign men, <laughs> so yeah, um, but it was really good for me to be here, and to be grounded, and um, so then the world opened, and um, we started, I, me and my friends started organizing festivals here on the island, like just party festivals. That was super fun. And I started doing the play parties regularly. That was really fun. Um, and then I got really into human design. People started asking me for readings. So then I started offering those. I started doing coaching. Um, I made a couple courses. Um, my last partner and I did retreats together. I've done retreats here on the island as well over the years. So it's just like, you know, you ask me like, Brittany, how do you travel? How do you have the money to do it? What I want to tell you, I want to finish with this is like literally anything that is your excitement, you can find a way to make money off of it and find a way that you can travel with it. I did it. I did it in ways that people still laugh at when they know the full story of how I was able to pay for things how I was able to get myself here and there. And I would just basically sit down, write out, where did I want to go? How much money was it going to come? And then I would start brainstorming in my expansive mindset. There is a possibility. There is a way for me to get there. And I would start listing out ways that it could happen. Some of them could be very magical. Some of them could be very practical. It didn't really matter because it was going to happen. I just chose where I wanted to go in the world. And I chose what was going to happen. And it happened. And a lot of times it happened in way more magical ways than I could have ever imagined. But all I needed to do was allow myself to be open and receptive to it happening. And that is the most beautiful thing I can share to you is that when you allow yourself to dream bigger, the universe is like, cool, we're going up a level. We could have given her this very basic version of her reality, but she's allowing herself to to be open to us giving her a way more ex expansive version of her reality. This is exciting. Let's do this. Let's go. So I'm giving you some of this energy that you can also do this. You can also expand your reality to live your 
highest timeline in this beautiful life that you have been given because it's so precious and you deserve it so much. <sighs> if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me or it's best to write it in the comments here because I always try and respond to those in the next episode. Um, and my, just like giving some housekeeping here, my, um, my first course that I just launched recently uh, about how to create your dream life that is ending soon and I'm about to launch another one about feminine embodiment so if you're like how does Brittany allow herself to receive all these things how is she in her yummy feminine energy while also out there you know doing all these big things in the world well I made a course exactly showing you how I do it and this is something that I'm stepping into more now because for me it's like how do I make impact that is expansive and yeah I can coach people one-on-one -on -one, I am happy to still do that, but what is feeling exciting for me is giving these larger impact, like making one to many, where I'm making a course, it can affect many people, and then anyone who wants to go deeper, then they can hire me for coaching, because um, at least they have these foundational resources and tools, and they've already kind of been onboarded a little bit, um, and yeah, that's, that's super exciting for me, so there's a lot more of that coming, that's what I'm stepping into now. And yeah, I'm sending you all lots of love and I hope you have a very beautiful and very expansive day.